I'm Larry Kirkpatrick, and I'd like to look with you at this uh, volume here, William Kavanaugh, The Myth of Religious Violence, and he's looking at this question about the difference between the secular and the religious kind of violence. Here's his definition of uh, religious violence. Religious violence is the idea that religion is a trans-historical and transcultural feature of human life, essentially distinct from secular features such as politics and economics, which has a peculiarly dangerous inclination to promote violence. So here's the basic thesis of uh, his book, that he takes on this myth. He approaches uh, several different authors, uh, different arguments about this, arguments that the secular world is rational and the religious world is irrational and violence is a peculiar problem and has to do with religion, but that's okay because the secular state has pretty much solved that for us. So we don't have a lot of religious violence anymore, except from cultures that are way behind. As soon as they get our version of the modern state, they'll, they'll be on the right plan. His viewpoint is, and just to put it in a nutshell, that there really isn't a, a, any kind of distinction you can really make between secular and religious violence that holds any water. On page four, he points out that this myth of the especially dangerous uh, nature of religious violence is really one of the founding myths of the modern state. It supports the modern state, the idea that the state is there to calm us down and, and take care of this and be the great arbiter of all these things. Actually, when he goes into it and plows into this and reviews scholar after scholar and writer after writer, he can't really find any sustained difference between secular violence and religious violence. And I think he's right. Here's what he says on page 8. He says that these different uh, theories all suffer from the same defect, the inability to find a convincing way to separate religious violence from secular violence. Each of the arguments I examine is beset by internal contradictions. And he does do that rather, uh, uh, it's a little bit thick reading, but he goes through and he, he just follows one after another. He works through their argumentation and shows how they really kind of have a blind spot. And here's where you get a benefit from looking into things that are outside of your culture, so to speak. Uh, but you have here, you know, I'm a Protestant Christian, but I think Kavanaugh is coming from a Catholic sense. Catholicism and Judaism, those are basically distinct. Islam, those are distinct civilizations. The modern Protestantism is so closely connected to the state that we might not see some of these things. We sort of blend them together. We so it's good to look at somebody else's uh, taking a look at this and find out what insights they've uh, gathered because they see through their own lens. So one of the people that he's looking at is Jurgensmeyer, and Jurgensmeyer picks up Timothy McVeigh and makes Timothy McVeigh an example of religious violence. How does he do that? Listen to what uh, we have on page 35 here. McVeigh spent three and a half years in the U.S. Army. After participating in the slaughter of a group of trapped Iraqi soldiers in the 1991 Gulf War, McVeigh is reported to have walked around taking snapshots of Iraqi corpses for his personal photo collection. When searching for the source of McVeigh's violence, however, Jurgensmeyer does not mention his army training, but homes in instead on the fact that although McVeigh was not affiliated with Christian identity, he read its newsletter and made several phone calls to its compound on the Oklahoma-Arkansas border. So there's just, just one case out of uh, many where there's nothing uh, really to make this connection. Just because you read a book or you got somebody's newsletter doesn't mean you're a part of him. He was explicitly not affiliated with this group. And yet, he's accused of being an example of religious violence. What about that three and a half years in the army? What about his time in Iraq? Did that have any possible, just maybe, maybe had a, a contribution to his violence? That would be secular violence, wouldn't it? Let's go to page 136. A major piece of the argumentation Kavanaugh looks at is the argument that the modern state was founded as a solution to these terrible religious wars. You have the Thirty Years' War and all these wars back in the 1500s and 1600s. And over here on page 136 of his book, he points out that there really was no significant interdenominational violence back in the uh, U.S. colonies. There really wasn't. Sure, the people were not fighting with each other. I'll read from page 136. Between Bacon's rebellion in 1676 and the year 1760, there were 18 armed uprisings aimed at overthrowing colonial governments in America, in addition to six slave rebellions and 40 significant riots mostly based on class cleavages. None of these conflicts, nor any others of which I am aware, had interdenominational strife as a principal motivating factor. Kind of interesting. This wasn't a problem. He lists uh, the Thirty Years' War, 
he goes through and he's got over 40 bullet points, 45 or so bullet points, where he goes through case after case after case after case of these different kinds of, of battles, these different wars, and uh, none of them really were serious religious wars. Many of them were uh, led by mercenaries and armies, and sometimes they had Catholics and Protestants fighting together on the same army against somebody else. They were really kind of state wars. They were kingdom wars and state wars. Here's just a few examples. Supposedly the Thirty Years' War that, that was these big terrible religious wars, they were mercenaries hired and made different, they were from different groups. Here's one on page 144 talking about an alliance of Lutheran princes. Catholic King Henry II of France attacked the Emperor's forces in 1552. The Catholic princes of the Empire stood by neutral while Charles went down to defeat. As Richard Dunn observes, quote, the German princes, Catholic and Lutheran, had in effect ganged up against the Habsburgs, unquote. As a result, the emperor had to accept the Peace of Augsburg, which granted the princes the right to determine their, the ecclesiastical affiliation of their subjects. Dunn notes that the German peasantry and urban working class, quote, were inclined to follow orders inertly on the religious issue and switch from Lutheran to Catholic or vice versa as their masters required, unquote. And there's more of this all the way through, uh, just, just, uh, bullet point after bullet point, page 146, collaboration between Protestants and Catholics of the lower classes was also widespread in the French wars of religion, mainly in an effort to resist abuse by the nobility and the crown. In Agen in 1562, the Catholic Baron Francis de Fumel forbade his Huguenot peasants from conducting services in the Calvinist manner. They revolted and were joined by hundreds of Catholic peasants. Together they seized Fumel's chateau and beheaded him in front of his wife. Holt comments, quote, the episode shows, above all, how difficult it is to divide 16th century French men and women into neat communities of Protestants and Catholics along doctrinal or even cultural lines. And there's more and more and pages and pages of this. So this idea that the state was a solution to these religious wars is really nonsense, and uh, Kavanaugh really kind of puts that together for us. So that's page 142 to 150, those bullet point summaries. But let me go to one that I found especially interesting, and it's on page 181 and 182, and I will read about a page of this for you. This is called the, the chapter four, The Uses of the Myth. And let me just read this. This is about something that might surprise you. The first chapter of Marty Martin's Politics, Religion, and the Common Good begins with a cautionary tale. In the 1940s, what could incite otherwise law-abiding white Christian Americans to treat a group of fellow white Christian citizens like this? In Nebraska, one member of this group was castrated. In Wyoming, another member was tarred and feathered. In Maine, six members were reportedly beaten. In Illinois, a caravan of group members was attacked. In other states, sheriffs looked the other way as people assaulted group members. The group's meeting places were also attacked. Members of the group were commonly arrested and then imprisoned without being charged. Marty reveals that the group in question was the Jehovah's Witnesses, whose offense in the eyes of their fellow citizens was to circulate pamphlets such as one entitled, quote, Reasons Why a True Follower of Jesus Christ Cannot Salute a Flag, unquote. In 1940, the Supreme Court had ruled that all American school children could be required to salute the U.S. flag. Marty comments that with war raging in Europe, quote, the country had to stand together, unquote. The Jehovah's Witnesses refused to comply. Now here's his comment. Here we have a nation on the brink of war enforcing reverence to its flag and violently persecuting a nonviolent group of people who believe that flag worship is idolatrous. One would think that the lesson Marty would draw from this story would be a warning against the violence of zealous nationalism. Astonishingly, the punchline of the story is a warning about the dangers of religion in public. Within three years, by the way, the Supreme Court reversed itself. Marty says, quote, but during the three years before that reversal, it became obvious that religion, which can pose us versus them, or them versus what we think the state should be and do, carries risks and can be perceived by others as dangerous. Religion can cause all kinds of trouble in the public arena. The world scene reveals many instances of terror and tragedy created by people acting in the name of religion. And then he comments one more time, as Marty uses it in this case, the term religion refers not to ritual putting one's hand over one's heart and reciting a pledge of allegiance to a piece of cloth endowed with totemic powers. The term religion applies only to the Jehovah's Witnesses' refusal to do so. And yet the violence against Jehovah's Witnesses is Exhibit A in Marty's warning about the violent tendencies of religion. Marty's own analysis of the religious symbols and rituals that characterize politics, which I examine in chapter one, is forgotten as soon as he turns to his argument that religion has a tendency to produce violence. In other words, because the religious people said we're not going to do that, the state exercised violence against them. And yet the, this person that he's reviewing takes that and uses that to attack the religious people.
Now, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness, but uh, they, were, they were well within their bounds on this point. Here you have the modern state being violent to other people. Christianity actually is a nonviolent religion. And if you look at what the Bible says, I mean, it's really based on this idea, Jesus' teaching in Matthew 7, verse 12, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. It's based on treating others as you would like to be treated. Dude, see if you think this is, uh, sounds like a violent religion, is th that in any way, shape, or form, these are the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 3 through 12. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So there you have uh, this terrible, violent Christian religion. Well, it's not a terrible, violent Christian religion because it's a nonviolent religion. The state is many magnitudes more violent than any true Christianity is. I'd like to finish with uh, just reading from... 1 Corinthians 13. Does this sound to you like a violent religion? I guess where I'm going with this is Christianity, Bible Christianity, is really its own civilization. And we shouldn't be looking at religion as being an especially violent thing. Actually, the state has killed many more millions, I think, than religion, so to speak, ever has. But here's what 1 Corinthians 13 says. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also am known. And now abide faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. So I think Kavanaugh's on to something here with uh, his review. There isn't really a big difference between religious violence and state violence. And when we go down to the difference between what the Bible teaches and the kind of blending these amalgamations of church and state in its various forms, that's where we get an awful lot of violence. So I just wanted to look at Kavanaugh, The Myth of Religious Violence. Kind of thick going, but uh, about 280 or so pages, and I would say a very, making a very good point. For too long, we have sort of thought that the, the, state, the state is the solution to violence, but we're, we're not choosing. We don't have to choose between secular and religious violence. What we need to do is go and see if we can find Jesus' nonviolent religion that's in the Bible. And I think then we can have some peace on earth. Jesus is really the solution. Jesus, who dies on the cross and therefore takes all that violence to himself and puts an end to it. And so I know it isn't really fashionable today to talk this way, to think this way, to, to uh, say these things, but Christianity has the answers that the state doesn't have. I am Larry Kirkpatrick. I'm the pastor of the Muskegon and Fremont, Michigan Seventh day Adventist churches. If you're ever in our area on a Saturday morning, that is the Seventh-day Sabbath, stop in and worship with us.